often thinking what does really bring alive music in this case it sounds like anything except I just made it up if it was written by some composer published and thought and excluding any option to make it up so to say we would have a dynamic range, we'll have a crescendo, diminuendo, expressive um, hairpin as we call it. We would have a phrasing, we'll have a pedaling. And then we'll have specialists to teach us the character, the spirit, the style, how much is too much. how much is too much in the rubato how much to linger on the dotted rhythm with the release of the 16th note which in turn by the rubato is lingering and you play together or slightly dislocated so that the melodic line can bring to fruition its note blossoming compared to the bass note then the left hand is written in 6-8 by the design of the arpeggios and the right hand obviously more in 3 Are we supposed to bring that out more with a pulse? Two times three versus three times two, uh, two. But you see, now that I make it up, of course it can remind us of many pieces of this style. Uh, nocturnes by composers of the 19th century. Except that because it's an improvisation on the spot, as I just uh, did for you, I'm at freedom to daydream the interpretation of it separately from the notes of it. Of course, I can take the score and write it down. And then somebody will play... it won't mean what it meant to me and fine since the medium is the transmission is the signs on uh, the paper and so how can they be rebrought to life with the emotion that it meant for me to imagine it perhaps in a way the interpretation is not part of the notation the hints are way too unprecise to be defined. And then you have the editor of the publisher, the eventual musicologist or um, scholar who will come to define the style and how it's supposed to be played. I believe that the interpretation is the soul and the notation is the body in an analogy of life and then as the ancient Greeks psyche breath used to place um, the soul in the breath then at death losing the breath the soul leaves and all of a sudden you see the body unanimated by anima in Latin um, soul So perhaps the notation is really the sarcophagus of the soul <laughs> and the soul is there passing perhaps through another one and who knows where but one sure thing is that all of a sudden miraculously perhaps that all of a sudden can be a century or two somebody will get onto it and go Oh, I like that. And I do that myself. 
as a performer when I read a piece like, I don't know. <laughs> intermezzo not that I feel like I wrote it or you did when you wrote it or read it because you might have felt also you wrote it in fact there is a sense of appropriation it becomes mine during the marvelous escapism and ephemeral time that I am touched by it and I feel like it was written for me because in mirror my own soul yearns for that and it becomes a unison merging of the soul of the receiver through time from the sender from time almost like as if it was another analogy would be a bottle in the message in a bottle in the ocean <laughs> When Francis Poulenc died in the early 60s of the 20th century, his lady friend um, Louise de Villemorin uh, gave the eulogy and she said, I quote from memory, um, you left us orphans with your music, Francis. Mostly she said, I will miss not being able to call you on the phone but I will reach to your music and I feel all of us who will play your music will be guardians of your orphans if, of course, I assume the orphans were the pieces. And then comes the point, my teacher studied with Fauré, so do I feel the right Fauré or the wrong Fauré? The, who owns the authenticity truth? Nobody really feel perhaps closer to certain um, stylistic elements of the aesthetic that are to do with the um, spirit of the composer's yearning. It's a signature phrase how you organize your melodic line when you write tonal. Is it floating? Is it structured? Is it harmonically organized? Does it just float on its own? And um, then that would determine if you uh, search for a centered space of gravity where the melodic line holds on a steeple. Or so you see, all of a sudden, there are ways of whispering it. Eh? always of expressing it. Now, when we play for an audience of a group of people, sometimes the performer feels obliged for interpretation purposes to be extroverted. And because you have to express something intimate in the mood, publicly to people, then you artificially raise the voice and you make it instead of being an avowal it becomes a declaration it becomes so perhaps to a certain extent when we um, project we um, betray but then if we whisper it to ourselves probably only people in the first few rows who might hear it and you know how it is it takes time for a group to keep their breath and silence themselves from noise making in order to focus their attention to hear something apparently not with a large volume of expression like a mandolin or perhaps a lute compared to an organ or a piano you see 
but are we here to demonstrate? Are we here to um, um, represent? Are we here to just state the piece? And ultimately, as a teacher, when I don't know the composer, the intent, other than for the notation hint, so the six, eight, the three, four, the phrasing, the hairpin, is it so much exactly how much, not too much, the rubato is never really indicated, but then stylistically we can add it. After all, all these I, I think all these things matter a lot because ultimately my conviction now is that there isn't a single right way or authentically right way that most likely and I don't identify with the composer because that would be of course unthinkable in terms of lack of humility but in terms of not knowing if the composer considers a variant interpretation as a betrayal per se, like they say Ravel used to say, you play my music, you don't interpret it or therefore you don't translate it. Um, this kind of objective uh, point of view, it's closer to the craftsman who cra cra carves the melody and then the accompaniment and then the pedal so if those elements are indicated on the score then the craftsman would say if I do it correctly without to try to overstate any of these elements and put it together I serve the piece and the piece exists on its own just like in the Brahms Involve myself. Because then the hairpin becomes larger and the expression of the two against three with the rubato becomes more dislocated. So immediately the whole domino system falls apart because it holds by that breath, the thread, the soul that animates the gaze, even if you're idle, but if you're dead, you're idle, but it doesn't animate the gaze, it's left. But when you're in, it can be so many different ways, I believe at least, and I would like to advocate that there must be a way to be respectful of the authenticity yearning and search while allowing it to express itself through you in the way that you feel it on the spot. There has to be something between the intemporal and the temporal, the notation for the pitches and the rhythms and then all what brings them alive that brings air into the pipes, so to say, should be allowed to be spontaneous and to be the response of your philosophic or emotional or um, lyrical understanding of it. It's almost like as if it speaks with um, different syllables for, for different um, um, words. You can say, I would like to tell you how, or I love you so more than then, or perhaps something else. Every time you put words, you have to be poetic or they have to be lyrics that fit so well the melody for the purpose of the storytelling that then they merge in magic way. And they don't, they don't. And if they do, they do. You know it when they don't, and you're very satisfied when they do. But here they are, in fact, missing. It's exactly like as if the person animated by feelings or emotions or affections for you looks at you 
or talks to you while looking at you. All of a sudden, then the speech becomes a translation of um, meaning rather than only the translation of the affect, which is already clear in the gaze. When a movie director or, or a theater director would say, don't overstate, don't overplay, just let it speak by itself. And you could say the same thing about the quote-unquote simplicity as we're taught, taught often. And I purposely took an example for this demonstration of something that I um, spontaneously made on the spot. Spontaneity is not a bad word. It can inject some of spontaneity in something very learned. Uh, I fear as a teacher observing students listening to many available interpretations besides the published edition suggestions and whatever I would as a teacher, they trust me to give them as an advice about the flow, the phrasing, the direction, the line, the meaning, the organization of the hands, the pedal for the harmonization, but not overwhelming the melodic line, which has to breathe on its own, etc. And then some spontaneous voicings. <laughs> sudden it's easy to say because we have time to think over it we study it we play it we practice it we replay it we go to a lesson we record ourselves we compare and then we think that's ah, too much just let it flow for what it is and it will appear on its own after all um if i notate it okay It will remain for whoever will pick it up. But then they'll inject inside it the air of their own soul in it. And they shouldn't play it and they won't play it unless it's meaningful to them. Oh yes, people play pieces because they're compulsory for competitions or because of um, situations where um, organizations um, uh, promote a composer's memory. Fine, these are not the motivational ways. The motivational ways when the music itself, itself, sorry, really makes you want to play it as a performer. Because then again, regardless of the time in between in terms of styles and time past and present, the sort of gap of time and civilizational changes, there's something about the human soul that is so uniquely there and that makes us identify with those meaningful yearning, hope, expression, happiness, sadness, or sadness with happiness. There's more than subtlety. Of course, if it was... hand melodically in major, left hand in minor, becomes more sophisticated. All of a sudden it has a double flare. And if it was uh, using the ascending minor, you have the flare of the major in the accompaniment. And if not, you have the harmonic minor.
to see in these modulations that I let myself purposely lost as if in a garden where I want to smell something that drives me to uh, look at the sky or gaze at something and I let myself float as if I am improvising it by the way I am but the point is is that I let myself float I have a certain control on the knowledge of the tonal system so I know how to return to B flat minor at some at other point chromaticism in harmonics whatever it takes but the point of my in demonstration was that in the flow of the events the emotional uh, uh, input of the interpretation over the notes and the pulse and the melody and the harmony were to do with um, the emotional outpour that i felt expressing in this um, continuation of that opening so in fact i didn't separate the interpretation from the composition like this craftsmanship of melodic harmonic and then um, rhythmic with pulse and then put together you choose what kind of dynamics and what kind of amount of this and how much of not too much of that rubato crescendo diminuendo no i think it comes naturally so if the person who will discover it one day if they do um, as we all do when we discover a piece of somebody from when who knows when and all of a sudden it's a magic moment in the sense not of magic trick but it's a moment of emotional um, yeah it's almost like as if the souls clinch and you feel like oh this is me or this is how I feel about it and he or she composer said it like I would have liked to have said it I just don't have those words to write that poem I don't have these capacity to paint that painting I don't have the hands to shape that sculpture I don't have the knowledge to say it through a film I don't know how to many things perhaps I don't even know how to express myself at all in terms of other than mundane survival things of consumerism I speak about spiritual uplifting humanity connection to the give something meaningful from your passage on earth encapsulated in few notes like in this and if I want to identify with Brahms so what <laughs> will tell me it's not right to do so much rubato it's who defines the good taste and who defines uh, the borders of the bad good taste authenticity or not of course as I said we have these articles by all these musicologists that's why they are here to regiment organize edit the publications and the editions that we trust in order to but beyond that, I think that when you reach the point where you learned about the restrictions and you know about the genres and you know about the style, if ultimately you're going to spend your life reciting it, then perhaps you shouldn't do it because you feel like it's always somewhere that you respect enough to be disconnected from it. I don't mean to disrespect the score, the authenticity, the edition. This is like the mantra of the 20th century last years but for music making but i think that beyond that without to go into the excessive opposite direction which would be improvise as much as you want add as many secondary voices or ter ternary voices you wish and make it into um, the piece you wish it to be which is what buzoni did with the bach chacon in d minor but then that was another time period we expected that from the interpreters to be reinventors re revisitors re restaters but i still think that in fact the music notation no matter how much i teach it to be closest to the intent of the composer to the student remains so full of approximation compared to the notation of the pitches and the rib and taking the risk to be wrong I take at least the risk to be earnest mm -hmm. 